All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here on a beautiful, sunshiny day, Legislative Day 36. This morning, we will call this meeting to order. Uh, Chairman Jaspers is so excited. <laughs> uh, I'll call on Vice Chairman Irwin to open us in prayer. Please bow your head. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to bless you. And thank you for the wisdom that you put in us and amongst us uh, every day. Uh, uh, guide us, help us have safe travels, Lord, and help us make best decisions, not only for ourselves, but for the children of the state. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, all right, Senator Thompson, if you will join us at the podium with Senate Bill 51. We, um, folks, we've got a full agenda this morning. So, sorry, Senator, one moment. Um, we have a sign up sheet out for anyone who would like to speak to a bill that under the TV over there. Again, we do have a full agenda this morning. So, we're going to try to be respectful of everyone's time and, and keep moving. So, Senator, if you will start us out with Senate Bill 51 and please confirm the LC number from members of the committee. Good morning, members. Um, LC 490346 should be Senate Bill 51. Do we have a substitute somewhere? Let me correct SB 51 FA then, which is going to appear the same. Uh, members of the committee, this is uh, SB 51. We've seen this legislation a number of years as we have sought to allow homeschoolers to have access to extracurricular activities within their uh, school. We've had to work on trying to redefine that because there were a lot of concerns over the number of years. The concerns were whether or not we'd have appropriate discipline whether or not we would represent the public school which they live in appropriately. And we tried to marry that together. You had a bill that came out of here as well. Um, one of the things that I would say is in the past, we have some conflicting ideas. Today, I'm proud to say that we have worked with some of the individuals that have had some concerns. We got Dr. Hines here with GHSA. We've worked with them. We've worked with some of the minority party to be able to address some of those concerns. But the basics of this bill is to allow homeschoolers to be able to have access to a school within their district to participate in not just sports, but your music and your arts and so on. We know going through the pandemic that isolation certainly took its toll on families and getting these kids to be able to participate is certainly a, something for their health. As well as now with them being required to take one of the courses, it's allowing these public schools to highlight what they have been doing to these families and potentially even uh, moving out of homeschooling into the public school. That, Mr. Chairman, I'll stop. I know you asked for me to be brief, so I'm going to try and respect that. Well, thank you very much. And again, I think the committee is familiar with the concept. So at this time, we'll entertain any questions that there may be. Courtney, are there any questions online? Seeing none here. Oh, sorry, Representative Evans. Yes, thank you so much, Senator, for bringing this bill. So how is it different from the bill we passed out of the House? Can you point out the language, please? Sure. There's a couple of um, couple of different lines, like line uh, five through seven uh, in Senate Bill 51. It reads as a qualifying course during any semester. And if you go to 545, this qualifying course facilitated, facilitated by the school. If you go to line 16, um, we have it titled as the Dexter Mosley Act. Uh, they changed it to well, equal opportunity for access. If I may, that one, that's kind of dear to me. I mean, that's, we, we have Miss Mosley sitting here. Dexter committed his life to homeschoolers and being a mentor. And I think we can all agree that it's important for us to have mentors for the young men and women. He unfortunately had a heart transplant, came back, we continued to mentor, and then God called him home leaving behind a, a widow and six children. So she's continued to, to pick up that cause. Uh, line 34, we have schools and clubs and organizations as provided in subsection. 545 says clubs and organizations as defined. Uh, line 46, uh, it says by way of dual enrollment, 
HB 545 says by way of dual credit. Which, by the way, Senator, just and Representative Evans, mm -hmm. by way of a dual credit course, which was the language in 545, um, is just the legal term for the dual enrollment course. So I, I didn't want there to be any confusion there that when we use that dual credit, dual enrollment, we're, we are talking about the same thing. Okay. So thank you, Senator. Please proceed. Yes, uh, line 70, 6970, it says for any semester in line 51, HB 545 says for each semester. Uh, line 74 says um, we have disciplinary, we have, it's spelled out. And one of the things is physical examination. Dr. Hines, I believe, had stated that's already covered. We don't, it's redundant, but it's in there. Um, lines 92 through 96 talks about provided, however, that such 12 month restriction on eligibility may be waived. Um, so a hardship case, 545, um, Dr. Hines said there already is provisions for hardship, so it can be redundant. That, that's really the, the crux of it. Thank you very much, Senator. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a well-drafted bill that um, a lot of very fine advocates have worked very hard on. So, Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion. Now would be the appropriate time. Motion do pass. We have a motion and a second that Senate Bill 51 do pass, and we are working on Senate Bill 51 FA. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Pause for online. Hmm. Any aye. opposed? Same sign. The ayes clearly have it. Motion carries. Thank you, Senator. And if you will get with me, we'll get that signed for you. Yes, sir. Thank you, very members of the committee and Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Senator Gooch, if you would join us and tell us what you have before the committee this morning, please, sir. All right. Good morning. Someone left their Georgia mask up here. Senator Thompson, do you have a Georgia Bulldog mask? I do. You might want to come. Ready? Yes, sir. You have a cluster pack? You can have it. <laughs> Good morning. SB uh, 47, you should have a substitute in front of you. Uh, it's LC number is 490523S. Is that correct? You may be looking at what passed. The... Yeah, I think I think this is what came out of the the uh, Senate. You should have a sub that was worked on over the weekend. I'm not sure if it's in your in your possession or not, but I can go. I can work off of this until we decide if there's a sub out or not. Uh, this bill deals with the special needs scholarship program in Georgia. Do we have that sub, Senator? I, I do not know. Um, Representative Wade is has been working with us over the weekend on that. Representative, do you know? Uh, so, Chairman, I think, I think it was emailed to you. Uh, I think it was I don't know which. Stand by one second, sure. Senator Liss. Senator, if you don't mind, if let us make copies. I apologize for that. Okay. Um, if you can pause for a moment, I know, I know we're under a time constraint, but if we can just get these copies made here, another Senate bill momentarily. All right. You mean stand down for a second? If you don't mind. All right. Thank you. Senator Harper, why don't, why don't we confirm this LC number real quick? Make sure we're <laughs> you got it in front of you. Four nine zero four eight three sub by substitute. Yes. All right. Senator Harper has been called to join us today. I'm going to present Senate Bill two thirteen. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, 
and uh, good to be with you. So uh, Senate Bill 213 actually comes uh, primarily from an issue that it uh, kind of spurred out of a, a situation in one of my local school districts. Uh, and um, and actually is, uh, is something that it uh, is, is just an intent to try to clarify the law because there's a misunderstanding um, by uh, individuals on whether or not the law allows uh, energy savings contracts uh, to be treated in the way that, uh, that some school systems already do uh, under current law, uh, and the law just didn't clear. And so uh, the purpose of Senate Bill 213 is just to clarify that uh, and clarify the law that uh, energy savings contracts is a method that can be used uh, to finance projects and to pay for projects over time uh, within a local school district. Um, one of the things uh, that this bill does is it provides conformity under Title 20. Uh, the the uh, current law, school systems could do it under Title 20 or Title 50. This shifts everything under Title 20 to make it clear that we're in the education code and that's what this is for. Uh, and it also allows school systems uh, in, in a way to save money uh, and use funds to hire teachers. I know in my local school system, uh, by them using this uh, type of contract, they were able to save enough money, they were able to hire three teachers. Uh, so I think it's important for us to make sure that we're giving our, our school systems uh, the options that they need to be able to, uh, to fund projects in a way that is uh, appropriate for them on the local level. Um, but at the same time that they're, they're able to, uh, to save dollars in, in a way, uh, and even in some cases, uh, be able to use those, those dollars that they save to, to hire educators and put more educators in the classroom. Um, this, uh, this particular bill has come a long way since it was introduced. Uh, we've made some significant changes in the Senate, um, but uh, the bill that you see before you, I think is a, a good piece of legislation that addressed a lot of the industry concerns that were out there. Uh, and, uh, and clarified uh, the bill that the, what the intent of the bill is and what the underlying intent is, is to clarify that uh, energy savings contracts, uh, whenever you use those contracts for the purpose of upgrading your HVAC systems or whatever, uh, that's a method that could be used to finance that project uh, to, for, for that school system to save dollars and they'll be able to use those East Floss dollars to help address that. So uh, Mr. Chairman, that's the main uh, underlying part of the bill and what it does. I'd be happy to answer any questions and address those as appropriate. Uh, and uh, if there are no questions, I'd appreciate your, your support. Absolutely, Representative Evans. Thank you for bringing this bill. Um, so what is your local school system? Well, I have 10 of them. Oh um, my, which one use this? So really uh, the it. one primarily is my home school system, which is Irwin County. Irwin County, great. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just so I can know, like, so I can take this back to my three school systems, you know, what was it like, what was it on an air conditioning system or what kind of energy savings? I think did they, they did it on an HVAC system. If I remember correctly. Yeah, it was a, it was a HVAC system. Okay. Right. And with this help, I, uh, before I was elected, um, I learned about, there was a school system that wanted to put solar panels on their school roofs. And there's some issue with Georgia power with them not being able to do that with it do you know is there so, so this, this this really this, wouldn't impact anything with any service contracts with georgia power because this i mean it was going to allow them to create their own power off yeah. of their own roof but uh it, it, it that 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 would that gets in kind of a different little arena with because you have to you're, you're dealing with an, a, a service provider uh such as georgia power uh it would arguably you could use an energy savings uh, contract or that provision to do something like that because you could save money over time, but you still have to you would still have to work with the the energy service provider, Georgia mm -hmm. Power EMC, whoever they may be, a MEAG, um, to 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 address that. So this doesn't this would not impact how that would operate. You still might be able to use this method to do that project, but you would still have to work with the the other service provider to uh, to kind of make that happen. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Any other questions from members of the committee? Chairman Cantrell. Uh, I'd like to make a motion. You're recognized for that motion. Move do pass. 
We have a motion and a second that Senate Bill 213 do pass. We're working on LC 490483 by substitute. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Senator. Chairman. And, and Representative who, Trey Rhodes, Chairman Rhodes, is going to carry this in the House. Chairman Rhodes, thank you very much, and I'll get with you and sign that when okay. you have that. I'll, I'll get it filled out today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you. Thank you to members of the committee. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Members of the committee, we're going to stand at ease for just a moment while we wait on these uh, copies of Senator Gooch's bill. Senator Brass, why don't you join us and tell us about Senate Bill 246, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I bring you SB 246. Uh, one thing we saw during the pandemic, uh, we saw a lot of creativity in our school systems. Um, a lot the school systems, the teachers, the administrative staff, even the students all had to adapt and really just continue on learning. And one of the things that came out of this pandemic is our parents adapted as well. Uh, parents trying to get back to school or I'm sorry, trying to get back to work, uh, but w found it difficult when they got kids at home. So uh, one thing that, that we saw really kind of evolve was, uh, and really not necessarily evolve, but just really be born was this thing called learning pods. And it was where we had groups of, of kids and parents in a, uh, in a neighborhood where the parents needed to get back to work. So they kind of alternated you know, a day of, of trying to help their kids learn through the virtual learning model. Um, you know, when they're having to do online classes, uh, you really needed someone there to, to help these students. And in order for, for the parents, or at least a majority of them, to get back to work, we saw these groups form up and they'd, they'd meet at a house. And, and it really became something known as a learning pod. And one thing we saw in, in during during the pandemic in other states, uh, we started to see local boards of education and the states really start coming down and and start putting some undue burden on these parents and on these students, uh, whether it be forcing them to get a license or forcing them um, just putting unnecessary regulations on them. So really, what we're doing is we're trying to get out ahead of that. Um, and uh, we're, we're trying to prevent that in this state from, from local boards or even our state coming down and, and putting these regulations on, on, these, on these learning pods because they're simply voluntary. So um, that's really what the bill does. Uh, we had to make a few changes once it got out of the Senate. Um, we met with, with the governor's office and DECAL. Uh, there's a thing in... Uh, that falls under decal known as a family child care learning home. Um, we wanted to clarify that this is not that and decal made it very clear they did not want to regulate these learning pods. 
but at some point they may have to uh, make sure that they aren't the same thing as a family child care learning home. So we made a few changes just to kind of clarify that. Uh, you'll see that in lines 31 through 37. Um, and then also in lines 18 through 23, we kind of went further into defining exactly what a learning pod is, because what we wanted to do was we wanted to clarify that these students are remote learning in K through 12 public education. And we didn't want it to be confused with um, a virtual learning model where the, the child is doing that full time. Uh, that is not what this is. And we just simply wanted to clarify that. So we did that in 18 through 23. And that's pretty much the bill. Well, and Senator, I appreciate you bringing this. I appreciate your hard work with, with the governor's office and with DECAL for members of the committee. I know Senator has, has worked very diligently and has had a very open mind and, and worked to get this, this version of the bill that, that's in front of us. Uh, our first two questions, Representative Wilson and then Representative Maynard will follow up online. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, this seems like a well-drafted draft bill. My question is, is this in response to anything that uh, we have seen, or is this purely preemptive? It's both. It's things we've seen in other states. We have not seen it in this state, and it's, so yes, it is preemptive. Can, can you just speak briefly about what you've seen in other states? So Broward County, Florida, specifically required um, – these learning pods, these parents to go get a license. And that is simply what we're not trying to do. Um, again, if it's a fi family child care learning home, then yes, you do need a license because the chances, basically you're a daycare at a home. Uh, that's not what this is. Typically these kids are being dropped off at a family friend or, you know, you know where your child is going. So that's all it is. Representative Maynard, online, please. Thank you, Chairman. Matthew, um, Representative Wilson asked my first question. The second question is, you mentioned that you've worked with DECAL. Are they now in approval of the version that you're presenting before it? My understanding is they are. And I, again, we've uh, met with DECAL in the governor's office uh, in my first meeting once it passed out of the Senate. Uh, and then my previous two meetings, or I'm sorry, the next two meetings were specifically with the governor's office. DECAL was not there, but um, by way of the governor's office, my understanding is that they are good to go. Thank, Thank you. you, Representative uh, Chairman Setzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this could be a friendly amendment or question, but I think the um, I've got my concern is that we don't um, there's been a overwhelming commitment in this legislature for the last two decades to not get into the homeschool law. Um, would you be amenable to simply taking the exact language you have here and creating a separate code section that stands on its own? So it's not in the homeschool code section. And the homeschool code section there is it, it, that is it is standing on a, on a knife's edge in terms of all the not wanting to regulate this and that and create a whole new structure this is um i didn't i didn't realize we we're in the homeschool code section until i sat down this morning so i just i don't have an issue with any of this language i just there's a real concern about being in the homeschool section because because the implications it, it creates and cast a shadow across that so I, I know it's not the gentleman's intent but structurally is there a reason that this same language could not be in its own own code section that would be, I think, a question directed towards Ledge Council, because yeah. I, I brought the language to Ledge Council and uh, me not being a lawyer, yeah. um, you know. I, I just I don't want this to run into any, I mean, it may not have in the Senate. I don't, I just, um, it's been seven years since we had a bill that opened the homeschool section. And it's just a, it's a very, very delicate thing. And I just think it's best to you know, this is its own standalone. It's because it's not homeschooling. You said this is this is pursuant to, you know, public K twelve, and I, I think those two perhaps ought to stand separately. And in, in the meantime, Senator Representative Carter has a question online.
Representative Carter, if you still have a question, please proceed. Okay. Um, while we're working on that language, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to sincerely apologize that I have too many pieces of paper here in front of me. We did put out a sign-up sheet, and I will find the three people who were signed up. I know two of the three personally who were signed up to speak to Senate Bill 51. Um, that is my my sincere apology for anyone that I missed to speak to that bill previously. We do have one person signed up to speak to this bill. So, Senator, if you wouldn't mind, we're going to allow Kyle Wingfield to come forward and, um, and speak to this bill. But let me also say to those online and those in the room, we do have a very full sign-up sheet for some of our other bills today. So I'm going to ask that, that you limit your comments to 90 seconds. Uh, I know that we have House rules and the Senate has priorities this morning. So uh, I know it's brief. Please forgive me, but we would ask you to keep those comments to 90 seconds. Mr. Wingfield, if you'll introduce yourself and speak to the bill, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Kyle Wingfield. I'm the president of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation based here in Atlanta. Uh, we do not endorse or oppose specific pieces of legislation, but I appreciate your invitation, Mr. Chairman, this morning to speak to the underlying issues here. Uh, Senator Brass covered most of uh, what we've observed in our research about these uh, learning pods. One point that I would just uh, make, because I've heard some people talking about, well, is this specific to the pandemic? Is this a limited time thing? Just this past Thursday, we saw almost a dozen school districts in the state of Georgia switch to a uh, remote learning day because of storms that were coming through. And there were uh, tens of thousands of children and their parents who were affected by this very last minute. It was a Wednesday night decision for Thursday morning. And we believe this is the, that learning pods are the exact kind of tool for parents to have to respond to those sorts of situations. If we had to have a license to operate a pod or have to be regulated or inspected in any kind of way, and Wednesday night, you're supposed to get that done between a communication from your school district Wednesday night and uh, the start of remote learning on Thursday morning. We just believe that's impractical. This is not uh, the kind of arrangement that the child care law was set up to address. And so we believe uh, that learning pods ought to be treated differently. And that's a real uh, example of why this is not a limited time situation. And I'll keep my comments to that. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Um, Senator Brass, if, if, if you would allow me to recognize uh, Mr. Walker from Ledge Council to speak to Chairman Setzler's um, question, I'd like to do that at his, this time so he could provide us a little bit of clarity. Mr. Chairman, you can do whatever you want. It's your committee. <laughs> Not looking for a vote or anything, are you? Mr. Walker, are you with us? You can't us? vote. Yes, sir, I am here. Um, Mr. Walker, Chairman Setzler is going to ask a direct question to try to clarify his his standing. Okay. Attorney Walker, thank you for being on. Uh, what code section number? How would how would one number a rather than this being a new subsection? How would one number a new code section uh, without stepping on an existing part of code? I know there's a six ninety point one, and that's there's a lot of code sections kind of sandwiched in there. What would the code section number be? Uh, following the discussion earlier, uh, I took a look for an alternative placement in the code and the uh, portion that jumps out uh, that would seem most inviting uh, to me as an alternative to where it's currently drafted would be in Article 4A, which concerns community involvement and education. The code sections that are in that article currently uh, are concerning uh, local school councils, but in the broader sense of community involvement and education, uh, that seems to me to be uh, fairly neatly aligned with what I understand the purpose of the learning pods to be. And so if there was an interest in creating a new code section, if it were the, uh, the either for the purposes of making an amendment or the will of the committee, uh, we could draft this as a standalone code section and the next number would be 20-2-87. Uh, okay. 
And, and I ask that if, if you could, uh, I was thinking about formulating some language as well. Again, I know it's the gentleman's intention and it's, uh, I think it's, 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 it's got great foresight to it to try to put this in place so that in furtherance of a public education system needing this to happen, you've got it. That is fundamentally different than the um, prerogative that, that families have for homeschooling. So uh, language, you know, that, nothing in this, if it were 20-2-87, could you formulate some language that would say nothing in this code section um, can be construed to make a learning pod have anything to do with 20-2-690 homeschooling or, home, or any home education program? Because again, my, my concern is the two could be inappropriately conflated as being one when this is purely the delivery of public education. Uh, yes, I can put together some language if that's uh, what is, is, that, is that the author's intention? I mean, yeah, sure. But, I, you know, for why stop there? Why don't we just go ahead and say it's didn't, not to be construed with any other law? Well, again, um, I mean, that's fine. If you want to do it, that's fine. I, I don't know that that's necessary, but if that's what you want to do, I mean, it's not, I don't think that affects the bill. So um, if, if you think that's necessary, I don't think it's necessary, but I'm not a member of this committee. So have to, at it. To, to, to Attorney Walker, isn't it true that 20-2-690 uh, is the homeschool code? Is that, am I right about that? Among other things, yes. It, it basically describes the three recognized forms of uh, education in Georgia. A student is, is enrolled either in a public school, a private school, or a homeschool program. Okay, so the, the homeschool section, again, I'm, I'm just purely going off memory here. Now, this isn't prepared. I didn't come in with an ambush. I sat down today and saw this and had no idea Understood. this was going to have, have, have an impact. I, forgive me for that, Mr. Chairman. But so is, is homeschool totally contained in one subsection or um, to? It is. It is contained in subsection C. Okay, so, so, so if this were. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your indulgence. If, if this were to stay in, in 20-2-690, six, we could we could add a simple language that says this has should not be construed to have any effect on subsection C. Is that is that what, how council would read that or accomplish that? Uh, yeah, it would be along those lines. If it were to stay in the current code section and that was the request, then yes, there would be a reference to subsection C of this code section being 20-2-690. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the indulgence. I, I, I would, at appropriate time, like to formulate simply that as a, you know, leave this alone, but simply make sure there's no, no, no reference to that. I know there's, because there's a different rulemaking structure with respect to homeschooling and in, in, in K-12. And I just, I, I know with last time we opened the homeschool code, which was a, very, a lot of very careful balancing of that to make sure that so appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, I would, would like to be recognized for a motion. Stand down one moment, Chairman Dix. Um, Mr. Chairman, I I think that the gentleman has done a good job of getting this together. It's been through legislative council, it's been through the Senate, it's been through the governor's office. I would like to make a motion that would pass the bill as it is. We'll hold that motion for a moment. Are there any other questions from the committee? What's your, what's your number, Dominic? Six. Floor Leader Lariccia. Just to follow up on Chairman Nix's comment, I, I think if, if you look at it carefully, even on like line 29 and 30, it, it says what primary education is, and that is kindergarten through 12th grade. I mean, it just it kind of lists that. That's not, that's not homeschool. Right. Now, I'm, I may be wrong. I'm just kind of old South Georgia country boy, but I believe – when it refers to primary education, it's saying K through 12, that is not homeschool. I think the language is pretty clear, Mr. Chairman. I I agree with Chairman Nick. Well, and that's been, um, to your point, Representative Lurikia there, we, every amendment we've made and every change we've made along the way is to, is to really narrowly focus it down to be very specific that we're talking about K through 12 public education. That is, that is, and it's very clear in my, humble opinion that that is all we're dealing with and you know anytime we 
we're concerned about opening up a certain code section, you know, once the bill gets signed, that code section's closed back down. And so if, if nobody makes any amendments uh, regarding homeschool, then it doesn't matter if the code section's open or not, in my humble opinion. Chairman Jaspers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it's more of a comment than a question. You know, I guess when I first learned about this bill earlier, I was excited to hear about it. And I want to just echo Chairman Setzler's question. That was the second question I asked about this, this language, mm -hmm. is how did it affect homeschooling? And I think you and others answered my questions very clearly. And as I looked through the, uh, I felt confident, as others have said, that the language really does clear it out very definitely for public school folks. It's very clear to me. And I just wanted to make that comment too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that's very reassuring coming from the person that's going to be carrying it in the house. So thank you. <laughs> Representative Carter online. I'm having some technical difficulties. Thank you. I was, um, the question I was trying to get clear on earlier was the, the purpose and intent of the bill. I understood uh, that you said that this uh, was uh, addressing um, regulating it, but I was trying to understand, was there something else that was concerning that you all were bringing this bill? I'm not opposed to it necessarily, but I just really wanted to understand it. Um, mainly because when you start bringing kids in other folks' homes, I just want to understand, you know, what's our, have we really thought this through? What are we thinking? So that's what I'm well, trying to understand. Yeah, thank you for that question, Representative Carter. Um, you know, I, I think it, to be very clear, we're not bringing people home. We're not bringing kids home. The schools are forcing them home, whether it be what we just saw was in a pandemic. And then just the other day, it was through, um, through emergency storms, uh, many kids, in fact, I've heard up to about a half a million kids were forced to be home uh, and forced into a virtual learning. So we aren't bringing them home. They are being forced home. And what we're trying to do here is give the parents the flexibility that they need uh, to be able to make a quick adjustment and get, get their kids in a learning mode um, that whatever their local school system forces on them, uh, allow the parents to be able to adjust so that they can get to work and continue out their, you know, their normal day, or at least as normal as possible. That is the intent of the bill. Thank you, Representative you know, Carter. I think he misunderstood my question. I was saying we're bringing, the learning part is bringing children from another home into someone else's home, not being forced home because whether it's a pandemic or a crisis and that 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 was what i was trying to understand with not regulating it we still have i mean i would have some concern you know pulling kids into a home that we don't really know what's going on and so i again i'm not opposed to it we have to do what we have to do uh, it's about bringing us together as a community ensure that the kids are learning i just wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything else that you were concerned about other than just regulate no ma'am i the the full intent here and this is you know i'm not going to go drop my child off at a, at a home i don't know we're talking about me going to my neighbor's house where they have a, a friend who has a child of the same age uh that will be learning in the same mode um as my child and me taking it to my friend's house or my neighbor's house so that they can help the children so that I can come up here and, and come to work. Uh, and then when it's my turn, maybe the child, the children, five or six kids, whatever, come to my house and I'm helping them through um, their daily learning so that their parents can go to work. And it's, again, we're just trying to keep um, the government out of the way so that parents can make a quick adjustment to carry out their day as normal as possible. That is all, or that is the sole intent of this bill. We're gonna have one final question from Representative Maynard. Um, thank you for bringing the bill. I do think it's a good bill. And I know a lot of communities that did do similar things, but they were not forced to regulate themselves. Yes, um, but based on what Representative Carter said, 
is it, and I didn't have a chance to read through it, but is it somewhere in there since we are creating this new purpose driven mm -hmm. mission to educate kids in these learning pods? It is true that your neighbor could abuse a child and you not know it. So I think her question is, is, are, is there anything in here that decal or somebody can? Um, yeah, so if you'll look at lines 31 through 37, so it says each learning pod shall remain subject to laws or other legal provision provisions relating to civil rights, insurance, conflicting interest transactions, the protection of the physical health and safety of its students. And again, that portion right there um, addresses your question, the protection of the physical health and the safety of its students and the pre prevention of unlawful conduct. So it's still illegal to abuse a child. Um, and you need to, I think one thing we all need to keep in mind is, is there are still family child care learning homes. And if you're dropping your child off into a, into a home or you don't know uh, the parent or, or you don't know the home, uh, that's when it crosses over into the family child care learning home. That's the difference. So the all is again, all laws still apply. They can't just because we're saying you can't, it can't be regulated. It doesn't give them a right to break the law. And, and let me assure the committee uh, in, in our conversations with decal, those, this was addressed and they are comfortable yes. uh, with that language. I mean, even if I don't drop my child off in a learning pod, I can't abuse my child at home by law. And there's nothing that. Uh, that doesn't mean people don't do it though. Correct. But it also doesn't mean we can't sit there and, and, and monitor every single person all the time. I mean, if we could, we'd put cameras in every home and we don't do that. Chairman Nix, you're recognized for a motion. I make a motion that we uh, do pass um, Senate Bill 246, LC 4905-22S. There's a motion do pass. Do we have a second? We have a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of Senate Bill 246, LC 4905-22 by substitute, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Thank you, Senator. And you mentioned you. that Chairman Jaspers will be carrying in the House. Correct, Mr. I'll Chairman. get with you to sign that rules sheet. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Y'all had some great questions. I appreciate the involvement. Thank you. Senator Gooch, if if you would join us back at the podium, members, you should all have your uh, have Senate Bill 47. And let me do my best to explain the posture that we're going to try to be in. Senator Gooch has, has very patiently waited on us this morning and he does need to make an amendment downstairs in a few minutes my goal is for him to present this bill and take as many questions as we can until he needs to depart at that time we'll take comment from the uh, audience and some of those via zoom at which point time senator gooch will come back and finish up the questions from the committee so i, I just want everybody to know when he exits stage left he's not he's not leaving us high and dry so uh, Senator, the floor is yours, sir. All right. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. Thank you again for letting me, letting me come here today. SB 47 is, is an amendment to an existing program that's been in effect for over 14 years. That's the Georgia Special Needs Scholarship, which currently serves 5,203 students across our state. This legislation has opened the door for students with special needs to pursue a private school option when the public school just was not working for that individual student. For the mass majority of the students in uh, our public school systems, which is roughly 1.7 million today, uh, 97, 98% of those students are being met by the needs of those pro public schools. This scholarship, however, provides opportunities when they aren't being provided for those needs of those children. Uh, Georgia established this program in 2007. It was based on the program known as the Florida McKay Scholarship for students with special needs. Florida recognized in 2011 that special needs students with the 504 plan also needed the opportunity that this scholarship provides. 
we are just a little bit late to making this change, but this legislation today would do that. It would amend the current law to allow for 504 eligible students to uh, take advantage of those scholarship opportunities that the IEP children today have in Georgia. Uh, this, this legislation does not change the fact that it's for special needs students. In fact, if you look in the bill, you will see what those special needs are that are listed under the 504 plan. I'm going to speak through them really quickly. Uh, one is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder known as HDHD, autism spectrum disorder, bipolar disorder, cancer, so, so cerebral palsy, cystic fibrosis, deafness, Down syndrome, drug or alcohol abuse, dual sensory impairment, dyslexia, emotional or behavioral disorder, epilepsy, hearing impairment, intellectual disability, muscular dystrophy, specific learning disability, spina bifida, traumatic brain injury, visual impairment, or any other rare disease ident identified by the National Institutes of Health's Genetic and Rare Diseases Information Center's list of rare disease orders. So there's roughly 20 diseases that are listed here on this uh, piece of legislation. And that would be the only uh, uh, allowable diagnosis uh, that are for children on the 504. There are other diagnoses with children under 504s in lo local schools today, but those will not be eligible for this scholarship. Now, some people are going to ask how many people are taking advantage of this opportunity today. I understand there's roughly 200,000 students in Georgia schools today that are under an IEP plan. Only 5,203 of those 200,000 are taking advantage of this scholarship. So that's roughly two and a half to three percent. Uh, there are 54,000 students in Georgia schools today that are under a 504 plan. None of those are in this program today. That's what this bill allows. So let me go over those numbers again. 200,000 that are IEP eligible today, only 5,000 are using the scholarship. Two to three percent, two and a half to three percent. If that same ratio applied to the 504 children, you're looking at an impact of, again, 3%, roughly 1,500 more students that would be added to the program. Obviously, no one can predict the future. None of us know how many children are going to qualify for the scholarship, but with the 14-year history that we have with the IEP program, it's safe to assume that you're going to have roughly the same percentage moving forward. It's taken us 14 years to get to where we are today. I do not believe that this will have an impact on our school's budgets. I will also remind you that a uh, FTE is transferable. If you take your student from your local school today to any other school system in, in Georgia that's a public school, that state funding follows that child. If you go to the private school, obviously the state funding doesn't follow the child, but the local school doesn't get the FTE monies either. Uh, this in no, in no way affects your local Avalorum tax, and it does not impact your federal funding at your local school level. With the uh, time that we have before us, Mr. Chairman, I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative, what number are you, 13? 11. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Gooch, I've got a couple of questions yes, sir. for you on it. Uh, how do you get a 504? Well, you can get it through a medical diagnosis by a doctor, like my son did. My son is now a, a high school senior, Lord willing. If he lives 22 uh, till the 22nd day of May, he's going to graduate with honors at Lumpkin County High School. Uh, he was at diagnosed when he was a young child in elementary school with the pro a problem. His teachers first identified that problem. They tested him at the school. And then we were referred to a pediatrician to where they went through further testing. And he was diagnosed with ADD and uh, went through several years of medication. I can tell you it was the most stressful thing that I've experienced in my lifetime. Uh, we worked with him at night trying to help him to learn and to study and stay focused, and it was a challenge. It was also a challenge for the teachers. It was a challenge in the classrooms because he required a little additional help to stay focused and learn how to take notes and stay on track. Uh, slowed down the rest of the progress in the classroom in, a, in an honors class too. I, was, I would say he was in the gifted program from first grade all the way through current 12th grade year. So uh, there's those methods. So the schools are involved, the Department of Education is involved in that uh, 
certification process. And so I think it's transparent and I think it's involving the parents as well. So the, the diagnosis came from a local doctor, correct? My, in my situation, it did, but through the coordination with the teachers, they were interviewed, they, they filled out paperwork. This is roughly 10 years ago. So my memory is a little bit bad, but the teachers filled out surveys and paperwork and discussed the issues that they were seeing with my son and coordinated that with my doctor. I understand what you went through. I, my grandson uh, is qual uh, has a 504 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a concern about uh, uh, the gaming of the system by uh, these companies that are, are allowing or giving diagnosis online where they don't actually see the child, uh, that uh, they, they do a diagnosis and then they take that, that uh, the parents take that diagnosis to the school and the school has to honor that now uh could could you uh, give me a i think we address that in the substitute that's before you today it removes the diagnosis by a physician or an outside doctor that's not part of the school system so okay. this diagnosis has to be approved by the school okay i i had not read that yes sir. that read that far in it yet i believe uh, senator and, and to your question i i believe lines 119 through 121 the state board of education shall adopt rules to provide for the verification uh i, I would hope that 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 language would assist in 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 your question in that situation all right and then one last question sure uh do the students give up their rights by accepting the scholarship they would their parents would the students okay. don't but the parents would make that decision which i think is appropriate if you're referring to the private schools, is that right? And that's addressed in the, the uh, I believe it's on the back end of the bill. So, uh, yes. And just, I'm going to go ahead and tell everybody the order. Representative Evans, followed by Representative Wilson, Chairman Setzler, and Representative Wynn. So, Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Senator. Um, uh, so, is there a cap on the number of students that well, can receive this scholarship? You know, we've had, we've been asked that question before. You could put a cap on it, but there's the, with the participation rate of three percent, I don't see that the the impact would be, you know, an issue at this point. And if, again, the child would be moving their FTE monies to a different school. Could be a public school. It's not necessarily a private school with this program. So there's really no fiscal impact to the state at all. The answer is zero impact. And so why would you cap it? Uh, may I pursue? Well, I, I do know that in the other voucher bill that this, uh, this committee considered that the bill sponsor did put a cap on it because there isn't maybe an impact to the state, but there is a big impact sure. you know, to the local school districts. Is that something that you would consider putting a well, cap on and this? I'm not sure if your bill you're referring to is the one that Representative Cantrell was carrying. Mm -hmm. This That did not pertain to special needs, I do not believe. This bill is narrowly defined for the special needs students in our state. Uh, 200,000 under an IEP, only 5,000 are utilizing the scholarship. Currently, we have 54,000 students eligible for this 504 plan. We believe 1,500 is probably a, an average number that could utilize it. Could be more, could be less. You know, the previous program's been in place for 14 years, only 3% utilization. So if you look at that statistic, then I think it'll be a long time before you would have to worry about a cap being hit unless you put it extremely low, but that would be at the will of the committee. Thank you. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, I'm a bit concerned because you keep using language like only these conditions and narrowly tailored to this, these conditions. But the actual language of this bill, if you look at starting line 93, it says the student has a section 504 plan relating to one or more conditions that are included among the conditions which shall be identified by the State Board of Education and which shall at a minimum include the following. Correct. So if the State Board of Education decides they want to expand this list, we're giving them the authority to do that, correct? That is correct. And we would also uh, always want to preserve that authority by the Department of Education to promulgate these rules and regulations, which you've already heard from the previous question earlier about the diagnosis. So I just want to make sure that we are speaking um, truthfully to the, sure. to the bill here. Well, um, and, the, and the bill is there in black and white. Obviously, the new language is underlined, so we're not trying to 
disguise any information from you. The State Board of Education would have ultimate control over those regulations that would be adopted. And of course, the local school board would be involved as well. And just one more question, Mr. Chairman, um, are there any reporting or transparency requirements in this? There bill? are, they're in the back section of the bill. If you look under um, the last section, it would start on lines 174, actually 171, dealing with the rules to administer the, the program, the eligibility and the transparency and the awareness. And then there would be surveys taken of the participants and the parents as to their satisfaction with the program. And on lines 179, you will see language dealing with the website, with the, the cost of the program and, and all of the transparency that goes with that as well. <clears throat> and I think ultimately the, per, the parent also has to make a decision. Is this what's best for their child? Uh, we talk a lot about local control in this building. I think the purest form of local control is the parent. Uh, what is best for your individual child's needs? One size does not fit all in Georgia. It doesn't fit all anywhere in the country or the world for that matter. I think as a parent, you have to decide what's best for your child going forward. And there's a lot of issues that, that are spelled out here. Until you've been affected by one of those, uh, you just really don't know what a, a parent goes through or a child. And so I think working with the doctors, working with your local school counselors and teachers, at some point you have to make a decision. Do I continue to put my child in this program at the local level, at the school, at the public school, or do we look for alternatives? And that's what a lot of parents are looking for today is an alternative. They prefer to stay in public schools. My family decided to keep our son at the public school and we've done well with that. It wasn't easy, but we were hopefully in 60 days, we're gonna graduate him and he'll go on from, from there to college. I'll recognize Chairman Setzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to, to the gentleman, thank you for for the your efforts on this a uh, couple questions for you um <clears throat> excuse me i represent a, a, a district that's in cobb county and there's a lot of families that have moved to cobb my, my district in particular to to take advantage of the great special needs programs we have sure within our public school system um isn't it true that if someone leaves another county and comes to for example cobb county or another county isn't it true their local district loses the state funding when the kid moves? Absolutely. Correct. So if a child from a district that could be any district of any representative here were to move and were to move to, for example, Baker Elementary School, which has an awesome program for special needs kids, their district would lose the state funding. So that's, that's it's no different than this bill with respect to that, that child moving. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. That, that point, Mr. Chairman. Um, likewise, if a child were to to leave their school system, uh, take the scholarship, um, the, uh, the, the broader K-12 system has a student that's, that's left. All the local dollars somewhere have still been, been levied to, to educate the kid. You know, the, the marriage of state funds and local funds come together, roughly a 50-50 proposition. Isn't it true that if parents avail themselves of this scholarship, that the local funding that's available has less kids to educate. So the per pupil funding actually goes up as a result of this program. People talk about robbing the schools. There's actually the per pupil funding increases for every parent that avails themselves of this program. Isn't that true? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Wynn, are you number six? I'm number one. One. Got it. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator. I have a couple questions, and I do echo the concerns that were brought up previously with line 95 um, with the, the word minimum, and then also concerns with the cap. But as we're talking about the financial aspect of it, um, it is a little unclear without a cap being in place, how, how this will play out. And I know you brought up the 3% <clears throat> average. How much did we spend on the program in the last fiscal year? Uh, this program did not exist last or year, the, but you're talking about the IEP. Not the IEP, but the special needs scholarship program in general. Uh, the student organization. I believe that number was, I want to say $9 million. I may be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But some of you in the room may have that number handy. I believe it was in the fiscal note. Oh, I didn't see a fiscal note. Okay. Well, I have it in my notes somewhere, but I, I can get back to you on that answer. Okay. And you and Senator, you stated that there were 5,203 students who 
have taken advantage? Those are the ones who are participating in the scholarship today, yes. Okay, today. Okay, so I guess. Or at I, least the, last last calendar year, last fiscal year. Okay, yeah, so I, I do want to know what that fiscal number is. And then, Senator, I know that we did talk about the lack of the cap there. What, and you used that 5,203, but if the Board of Education were to choose to expand the minimum qualifications and the program grew exponentially, um, how would that impact our school districts and how can we handle that fiscally? Well, I think the Representative Sessler's point, uh, anytime a student moves from one school district to the other, the FTE money follows them. Uh, you know, in the case of Gwinnett County, I believe there's 327 students that are participating in this scholarship program today in a Gwinnett County private school. And so if those children for suddenly just shut down that school, if the school system shut down, the private school shut down, those 327 children would have to go back to the public school system. So I would say that Gwinnett County would have to look for more funds to, to educate those children. I don't think it would be a, an influx unless you're making profit off of the FTE money which I don't think any school administrator in the state of Georgia would say that they're making money off of our FTEs. They tell me they're not making enough. They're asking every year for more money. So I think it could have the, the adverse impact. It could be a, a huge increase to their budget if those students came back to those public schools. And so I think that this is a, a fair uh, argument that there's no impact to the school systems because they're not delivering the services those children need, especially the IEP children, because a lot of them have specialized needs that are ranked based on their, their special needs and their disabilities, what have you, whether they're in a wheelchair or whatever. And so I think this program actually may help uh, the school system, and it would definitely help the teachers that I've talked to that are having to to work with these children with these special needs and at, this, at the expense of the other students in that classroom. And Mr. Chair, I just have one more question. Um, Senator, um, if it doesn't impact, or if you perceive that it won't impact the school districts, why are so many school districts opposed to this, and including both of mine, Atlanta and DeKalb? Well, I've heard from one school superintendent in my district, I represent eight counties, I've had conversations with one school superintendent over this bill. Once I explained the bill to him, he was like, I get it. I don't see it. It's going to impact us in a bad way. So I'm not sure who you've heard from, but I know you get emails from different organizations and associations and they send out scare tactics. They send out information. A lot of times it's not accurate. I'm not saying what you've received is inaccurate, but I can tell you from some of the things I've seen in this building over the last 10 years, it's not accurate information. Uh, and so I would just encourage you to look at this, not necessarily as a impact financially to a school district, but back to what's good for the child. We should allow parents to make decisions based on what their individual child's needs are. And I believe this is a good, a good, a good method. It may not be utilized by a lot of people, but if it helps a few people, I think it's worth it. R Thank you, Senator. Representative Maynard, Senator has to leave. Please be brief. Um, so just to clarify, line 80, 68, it says Part B of the Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Does that mean that these diagnoses um, are from IDEA? And also, does that mean if the State Board of Education were to expand these diagnoses that the diagnoses would have to come from this federal act or can they use any diagnoses they want or are all these diagnoses based on federal law you know you're you're asking a good question i believe the answer is yes to your question it was a multi-part question but i do believe that it would all have to funnel under the the idea which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and the 504 Act, which is federal uh, legislation as well. And the IEP is also federal legislation. So all of these requirements would have to meet the federal standard. But anytime the Department of Education has the ability to promulgate rules and regulations for these programs, then I think they're making decisions what's best for the local school districts as well. And I think some of their uh, input to this bill has been uh, incorporated into this language. I'm not going to say they support it because they may not. We'll know in just a few minutes if they come up and speak against it. But I do, I do believe it answers your question. 
And if I can just do one quick follow up, if a child were to go from one school district to another school district because the other school district has a better program for kids with disabilities, yes. are they at will to say, no, we don't want the child or is it based on availability? You know, that's a good question for some of my brothers on the committee here. I think Representative Wade spent many years on the school board and uh, uh, Representative Benton was in the school system for many years. And of course, Representative Irvin was a school superintendent as well. They can probably answer that question better than me trying to take a stab at it. But I do not, I do not believe there's a problem with a, st a student moving to another public school district is my, is, is, is my um, opinion. But Senator, I have 908. Do you have time for a very got, brief? Yes, sir. I have two more minutes and I'll come back. But no, I'd like for Rep Representative Wade to uh, assume the position of answering some of these questions if you'd prefer. We're, we're going to give one last question to sure. Floor Leader Laricia and then you can be excused while we take public testimony. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just quickly on that participation rate of the 200,000 IEP, you said there's only about a 2% participation in that. And there are 5,000 roughly, two and a half, three. And so I think that speaks to the tremendous job that our public education system's doing. But uh, we're always reminded in this room about the voice that the public education system has. And they have 95,000 teachers that have a tremendous voice. The uh, Association of School Boards have a voice. But let me tell you who don't have a voice are some of the parents of these children that have a child of IEP or 504. That's right. And what this really does is gives them an opportunity to negotiate at the local level. You mentioned how local school systems, they, we want local control. Well, that is true is if they're in control. And so this gives these parents of these children with IEP and 504 to go to that school system and say, hey, we need a little extra help. And if they can't meet that need for whatever reason, they have an option. Uh, it's not rocket science. We're not reinventing the wheel. This is a 14 year old program that has some success, very low participation, because like in my district, I have excellent school systems. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your work. Thank you. Appreciate it. Senator, again, we have about 20 or 25 minutes worth of, of testimony at this point. We'll see you back. I'll be back momentarily. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen online and those who are here with us in person, uh, ha having a name like Dubnik, I do my best to get names correct. So please forgive me if I choose the, the, your first or last name because it's easier for me to pronounce. And I apologize in advance for um, any mistakes I make would also remind you that I need to respectfully ask that we keep those comments to, to around 90 seconds to be consistent uh, with, with what we said. We still have an agenda to, to attend to. So I believe we have some folks online. Um, we will start first with Lisa Morgan, who I believe is in the room with us. And then just so you're aware, uh, Patricia Neely online will be the second speaker. So Ms. Morgan, if you will join us at the podium. And if I could just ask everyone today when you're speaking, please start to introduce yourself and tell us if there's an organization you're with so that members of the committee are aware. Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay. Good morning. I am Lisa Morgan, a kindergarten teacher and the current president of the Georgia Association of Educators. I stand before you today in opposition to Senate Bill 47 and ask that you vote for our public schools, their students, and our educators by voting no on Senate Bill 47. The current program costs $35 million per year for 5,000 students. This expansion of vouchers ignores several facts. The students involved with an IEP or a 504 plan already receive in our public schools all the accommodations and specialized instruction necessary due to their exceptionality. Their parents are intimately involved because we are required to have an annual review in our public schools for their needs and their accommodations. Unfortunately, in its 14 year history, the average student in the program is white, male, and from Metro Atlanta. No county below the Georgia fall line has more than one private school that accepts these vouchers. So in reality, the private schools are not able to meet the needs of these exceptional students. 
I would like to share an analogy with you this morning. If my community decides that our local police are not patrolling enough and providing the protection we believe is necessary, we can hire private security to do the patrols that the police normally do. Do we then come to you and ask for a voucher to reimburse us for the cost we pay to that private security company? The lady's time has expired. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Patricia Neely, who I believe is joining us online. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. My name is Patricia Neely and I'm a parent and I'm here to ask your support for SB 47. I'm a Clayton County parent of two amazing children. My daughter, who is a Clayton County Public School graduate and soon to be college graduate, and my son, who currently attends school virtually, was diagnosed with autism and ADHD. I'm here today because I personally understand that every child has unique needs. See, my daughter was a traditional student and the system worked just fine for her. On the other hand, my son didn't have the same experience. Since his first day in traditional public school, I've had to advocate to ensure he had a quality education. And with his time in the traditional school district, he has been moved three times. Each time we were told this would be a perfect fit for him and were ushered to another school only to repeat the same situation over and over again. And I finally said enough and started looking at options beyond our school district. I remember one of our IEP meetings that there was mention of the Georgia Special Needs Scholarship. This scholarship program allows my student to attend an approved private, private school. This program gave me hope that we could get to find the right learning environment for him. During my search, I found multiple schools that catered to his special needs. And as a single mom, the, the scholarship gave me the financial support to make this happen. But due to the pandemic and my concern of safety, we opted to use a, a virtual charter option this year. My hope is that we can have an in-person option for next year. I know that there are thousands of students that would be able to take advantage of this program just like mine and don't have the access. The traditional school environment does not work for everyone. I saw this with my own two children. This is why I hope that you move forward with the effort to improve and expand the Georgia Special Needs Scholarship. I see this scholarship as a tool to my child's education time has toolbox. Expired. Thank you. Next up on Zoom, Jenna Chund. Hello, my name is Jennifer Chung and I am here to ask that you support SB 47. I am a parent in the Gwinnett County School District and I have three elementary age daughters in the public school system that have a variety of special needs. Two of my children now have IEPs and one child has a 504. Our experience in the public school system has been difficult. In each child's case, it has been challenging for them to find the right educational environment to suit their needs. Because of their individual needs, it can cause them to be placed at different schools from year to year. This has been difficult to navigate and has, for my children and has also caused me to put my career on hold. We are currently in the process of getting my child with a 504 and IEP, but due to the pandemic and other issues, we have not been able to complete the process. As a parent, I am concerned that she is missing on critical services and therapies. We cannot wait another school year for services to be put in place. There is a private school in our area that can meet the needs of all of my children. The school is authorized under the Georgia Special Needs Scholarship Program. With the passage of this legislation, this would mean my family would have the opportunity for all three of our elementary age children, including my child with a 504, to be at the same school and allow each of them to get the support they need without having to wait another school year. It would also mean that I would no longer have to pause my career to stay home coordinating the unique needs that having three special needs children in this public school system creates. I'm a supporter of public schools. I do believe they work for most children most of the time. However, the one size fits all model does not work for my family. My hope is that you pass the legislation today and ensure that all children with special needs have access to a learning environment that works for them and their families. Please support SB 47. Thank you very much. Next on Zoom, Ellie Anglin. Hi, uh, my name is Ellie Anglin. I live in Gainesville, Georgia. I am the mother of an 11 year old daughter who has sensory auditory processing disorders, anxiety, ADHD, dyslexia, and dysgraphia. She currently has a 504 plan. And what we have learned from having a special needs daughter is that one size does not fit all. Our public school system has been unable to give her the support, individualized instruction and environment she needs to succeed in school. 
We've been working to get her an IEP, but COVID has delayed that process. Since my daughter doesn't have an IEP, she currently doesn't qualify for special needs scholarship, which puts me in a situation of doing what's best for my child versus what we can financially afford. My daughter has been struggling in public school for six years. Last fall, I found a private school that meets her educational needs and they specialize in children with learning disabilities and special needs. And the only way we've been able to afford it this year is from a private scholarship through the school and that's not a guarantee for future years. Not all schools are created equal for all children. Since she has been attending this private school, she has made amazing progress, especially with reading and writing. She's excited to go to school every day, never wants to miss a day. She tells me that this school makes her happy because she knows she's learning. She told me on the first day of school that this school is like a family and that other kids are like her with similar difficulties. So we ask you to please support SB 47 so that families like mine can find support when they need it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, via Zoom, uh, Brandy Sempro. Yes, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning. My name is Brandy Sempre and my family and I are residents of Fayetteville, Georgia. I'm here today to request your support for State Bill 47. And as a mom with a child on the autism spectrum, I wanna briefly share the impact the scholarship has had on my son, Elijah, and our family. At the age of three, my son Elijah was diagnosed with autism after failing to meet a number of developmental milestones. His diagnosis required intense early intervention in a place where he could grow and thrive and receive the care and support he needed. We found that place at the Joseph Sam School in Fayetteville where they specialize in physical, intellectual and developmental disabilities. We love the school because of all of the specialized support and professional expertise, but with this level of support came a pretty high tuition and this was a serious problem for my family's household budget. The tuition cost was a significant financial strain and also caused us to forego other recommended therapies for Elijah. We had to consider the devastating thought of withdrawing him from school. While searching for solutions to keep him in school, we found out about the Georgia Special Needs Scholarship that helps families afford the schools that provide the best environment for their children. The day Elijah was approved was one of the best days of my life. It was a blessing. The scholarship helped with the cost of tuition and with this help, we were able to incorporate some of the other therapies he needed. None of it would have been possible if the scholarship didn't exist. Elijah is now seven and he's learning to read and dress himself. And my wish for other parents of children with special needs is to receive the same opportunity. And I know our legislators want that too. So please vote to pass State Bill 47. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next online, Tiffany Pierce. Thank you. Um, my son Aiden was diagnosed with autism when he was young. At the age of eight, he started having some episodes. His public school stated that they wanted to suspend him, expel him. Aiden did not understand what was happening to him. He asked me if he could be in heaven. After a year in the hospital, when trying to transition back to school and after multiple additional neurological diagnoses, the school stated that they could not support him. Annie and Diamond of Core Community School came out to see us at the hospital. And I'll never forget them saying, we, we want Aiden, we want him. He deserves to be wanted, all kids do. It's the first time I felt hope. Because of the one-year exclusion and the Georgia Special Needs Scholarship, Aiden wasn't eligible. It was another battle to get him approved through medical waiver. There's a chance that Aiden could also be back into the hospital at some point in his life and going through this process again would be almost unbearable. I ask that you please support Aiden and all kids like him who just want to learn and be happy. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next up, Dr. Johnston Jones, and I believe we may have two speakers um, in one Zoom. That is correct. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, my name is Annie Johnston Jones, and I'm the co-founder and director of Core Community School. We are a private school in Cherokee County located in Woodstock, and we serve kids who have various factors interfering with their success. You just heard one of our awesome parents, Tiffany, talking about her son's experience here at our school. Um, our students 
a lot of our students struggle with diagnosed learning disabilities, um, and many of our students struggle with social emotional needs. We have a wide range of needs here at CORE. And uh, many of our families use the special needs scholarship to make it where they can afford our tuition. And that is with our relatively low tuition costs um, that we provide here. Um, we have many families who just simply could not be here without the uh, special needs scholarship. And SB 47 makes it where many of these families that currently just don't, you know, are ineligible for it, will be able to get this education. Um, Lots of our families have had quite the journey. Um, they discovered public school wasn't working for their child for one reason or another early on and have bounced from public, from public school to private school to private school. Many have pulled them out and homeschooled their kids. Um, as you saw, as you heard from Tiffany, some of our families have had to hospitalize their children. So um, we are serving a pretty unique segment of the population and um, the, scholarship, the scholarship is just necessary for these families to be able to access what their kids need. And SB 47 will expand that to um, make it meet the needs of families in very, very unique situations like we see here at CORE. And here with me is one of our awesome teachers, Virgo Morrison, to share his thoughts. Hello, thank you all for hearing me. I teach high school social studies at, at CORE. And I just wanna say that schools like CORE just save kids' lives. I've seen it firsthand here. Um, kids come here full of anxiety and depression. And then in this, productive and nourishing environment, they turn into people who are vibrant and sociable, and they want to learn, they want to live, they want to express themselves freely. That's why I think it's so important to increase the access um, to schools like this. I, I support SB 47, and I hope you all um, take this testimony as, as what it is, like this saves people's lives. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you both very much for being here. Next, Ms. Margaret. And I think the rest of our speakers are in the room. So while she's coming up, um, Gretchen Walton will be next, followed by George Ray. Good morning. I'm Margaret Ciccarelli from PAGE, um, the Professional Association of Georgia Educators, representing about 95,000 educators statewide, classroom teachers, administrators, and also support staff. I emailed y'all last week about a previous iteration of the bill. Um, and do wanna say in follow up to that, that what Paige has a longstanding priority to um, support the prioritization of public dollars for, for public schools. But I want to acknowledge that it's clear that a lot of work has been done on this bill, that a lot of advocates have been heard. Um, and we are grateful for that. And I wanna be very transparent um, and plain spoken about that. So thank you. Now that being said, I think there are a couple of additional things that could happen with the legislation that would improve it further um, if you decide to pass it. The most important thing to consider about this legislation is that when a student either in the IEP process or one who would uh, accept it under 504 loses their legal right in the public school setting to accommodation for their services. So with that in mind, if we are listening to these parents and other advocates and we want to help them make informed decisions, let's give them more information about the private schools that they may be considering, such as um, what the graduation rate of those private schools are, what services they can provide for those families. Also consider adding some transparency that parallels Georgia's tuition tax credit program, collecting the quartile, uh, the financial quartile of the families who are participating. I would also consider a reevaluation of the 504 after several years, just as would happen in the public school setting. Um, and finally, uh, consider a means test to ensure that families who need it the most are the ones qualifying for this. Additionally, and, and I know that time does not really allow for this, I'm going through the 504 and IEP process with one of my own children. Um, I have three elementary children of my own in the, in the public school system. So if any of you'd like to talk about our experience and what that's like, I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. 
Gretchen Walton with Cobb County Schools. Um, I wish Senator Gooch were here because I do appreciate the work he's put in. Um, there were a lot of changes and I thought I was going to have to, before seeing the sub, I thought I was going to have to get up and say what I said on the other side. So <laughs> I'm glad to see that a lot of those changes have been incorporated. Um, I, I do still think that we need to be mindful that this program has no requirement for reevaluation. And while we're looking, as the parent said, to improve and expand, if that's what you're looking to do, one major improvement that could be made in general to the special needs scholarship program would be a reevaluation in public school settings. The IEPs are, are reevaluated every year. Well, they're, I'm sorry, they're reviewed every year. 504s also have the opportunity for review every year. And then eligibility is reviewed every three years. So we, we would ask that you consider as you are looking to improve and expand that there be some consideration for reevaluation added to what you're considering. Thank you. Thank you. And let me, again, personally apologize for missing you earlier. You wrote your name down twice, like you were supposed to. I read it one time and I apologize that I did not call on you to speak to Senator Thompson's bill. So please forgive me. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is George Ray. I'm with the Georgia Education Coalition. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you briefly. Um, though we have not uh, seen, not analyzed the substitute that's been presented today, uh, we did send a letter to each member, so I won't go into depth of that, other than to say that uh, the points that we make in that letter, we believe are still in force with uh, the substitutes being presented. First, that this uh, legislation will require the waiver of student protections and accommodations that are provided under federal law. Those are real rights enforceable by real administrative processes and access to the courts if they're not fulfilled. Those go away when students accept these scholarships. Second, we've this legislature has worked hard to ensure accountability and transparency at the public schools with the dollars that you invest in public education. The legislation will not apply that same transparency and accountability on private schools and students who take that scholarship. So while I appreciate the work that's been done on the bill and appreciate the, those on this committee who've worked on it, we still stand in opposition to Senate Bill 47. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Costley. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, committee members. Uh, we, uh, I represent the Georgia Association of Educational Leaders, who are principals, superintendents, and assistant principals who are in the hallways as we speak. Uh, serving our 1.7 million children. So I want you to know that we, if there's a group that supports the, the best interest of children, I believe I represent them. A um, couple, just a, a few little things, uh, just based on earlier comments, the, the figure is 35 million uh, for the small group. To get an IEP, it takes sometimes 12, 18 weeks to get an IEP, go through a psychological process, et cetera. So there are, there are limitations to this to make sure it's right when it's done. To get a 504 can take a matter of a couple of days. Um, the 504 process is, uh, is a set of rights that were fought for over decades to give protections to students who were not getting them for decades in the country. Federal law finally gave those kids those rights. And we, we, we are very concerned that we would now use a process to gain those rights as a ticket to get public tax money to go to a private school that does not have to give the services at all. I wanna to say to all the parents that are listening to this, there are some really great private schools that give great services to kids. And we're not, in, we're not opposed to uh, the American right to choose how to educate one's child. Homeschool is a, is a valid model. The difference in homeschool and public school is, is you don't fund homeschool. So you don't regulate it. I mean, very, very little. They have that choice to do that and you give those parents rights, but they don't get to take tax money with them. And what we're asking you to consider is, is if we're gonna send potentially hundreds of millions of dollars a year. It's $35 million with a small uh, thing now. Uh, we got to check on the kids. We've talked a lot about money, but we haven't talked about the kids. What happens to the kids that goes to the private schools that don't have those great stories? And we'll never know what those stories are because we don't check on them. Thank you so much. Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Uh, one more speaker in the room, uh, Grace Kim. And then we have one more parent online who will speak as well. Good morning, my name is Grace Kim. I'm with the Georgia School Board Association. The Georgia School Board Association opposes the expansion of the special needs voucher. This will be the third expansion uh, of the special needs voucher uh, since its inception. 
This bill will expand the bill to include 504 students and one um, as well as increase the, uh, I'm sorry, reduce the uh, one year um, prior attendance requirement for the students that are currently enrolled. I won't reiterate some of the transparency and other accountability questions that have already been brought up. I will ask you to look and consider the fees that are being um, given out um, for the students. Um, there is no current accountability for how those fees will be used. The current scholarship requires, um, uh, permits the board to refuse to do business with private schools that don't um, return funds quickly or um, are misleading in some way in their dealings with state funds. The fees, however, there's nothing that the school, um, the school board can do to stop those fees from being used inappropriately or if the fees are not being returned to the state um, at the appropriate time. Um, finally, we just ask that you consider how much money is being spent um, with this new version of the bill. And um, if uh, the students are getting the fees or their or services or they're not getting the services, the public has a right to know. Thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, online, Miss Susan. Good morning. My name is Susan Brew, and I'm here to ask for your support for Bill SB 47. I'm a Cobb County native, went to Cobb schools, taught in Cobb schools, and I'm a huge public school supporter. Both of my daughters were diagnosed with dyslexia last fall. Unfortunately, Cobb schools do not have any program to teach them in the specialized way that dyslexic children need to learn to read and be successful in school. Seeing them struggle in reading is heartbreaking for me and incredibly frustrating and defeating for them. They both have high anxiety because of their dyslexia and lack of help in the public schools. Both of my girls have a 504 plan. We've been in the process to try to get them an IEP, but neither qualify because they are not below grade level in reading or writing, a requirement for them to get an IEP. The pandemic has also slowed our efforts with having data collected, getting meetings scheduled, etc. The effort it takes to get an IEP is daunting. We've had to sit through numerous hours long meetings and argue to get them the help they need and deserve. My girls are not failing because we go to tutoring for four hours a week with a dyslexic specific tutor. They're not failing because I work tirelessly with them to help them and I refuse to let their self-confidence be ruined just to get them help. I've been told countless times the only way to get them help and to get them an IEP is to let them fail. I cannot as a parent and educator let my children fail. Even if they were to fail and get an IEP, Cobb schools still do not have a program to help dyslexic children. They're not trained to recognize dyslexia nor to teach children with this learning disability. This bill would give us the opportunity to get our daughters into a school that will immerse them in dyslexic specific instruction so they can be remediated and hopefully go back to public schools. Any funding would greatly help us and numerous other families with special needs children. Please help make this bill into law. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our 17 speakers this morning, Senator. If you'll join us at the podium, your timing is impeccable. Um, I, I, I do have a couple of quick questions, Senator. Yes, sir. So we've heard from a number of, of speakers this morning that the current cost of the program is, is $35 million. Now, I, I can't validate that for myself right now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go under the assumption that that's true. And you, you mentioned earlier there's 5,000 students currently utilizing this, this scholarship. Is that, is that accurate? That is, that is so that would be a, a $7,000 per dollar per student um, um, cost, if you will. And that is, I believe that is in line with the average tuition scholarship that we have today. So I was going to mention that earlier. In fact, my numbers were $6,700, $6,800. So we're real close on that. Okay. So I, I know that question came up earlier okay. and to members of the committee, I'm not, I'm not speaking for the validity of those numbers. I just know a couple of members had questions. Um, Senator, do you have any closing comments to add for the committee? Uh, let me just say this. I believe if you if you talk to the experts in the room from the Department of Ed and, and some of the experts on your committee, they will tell you that an FTE equivalent for a 504 student will be less than that of an IEP student because of the level of services that the school systems have to provide. So when you look at the average of 7,000 per student per IEP, I think the average for the 504 student is going to be far less than that. And so I guess we'll just have to see as time moves on. A year from now or two years from now, as this bill is in place in the law and it rolls out, if we see it's going to be abused and if we see it's going to have a, a negative impact to the school system, we can always come back in here and we can apply caps. We can make amendments or changes to it. 
Nothing we do in here today is forever. And so I would ask you all to consider this for the good of the child and for the parents out there who have struggled. Um, I, I'm not asking personally because my son will be graduating in a couple months, but I can tell you there's 50,000 other students today that may or may not need this tool, but it's another tool in the toolbox and I think we ought to give it to them. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate it. Chairman Cantrell, you're recognized for a motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move due pass. We have a motion that too many pieces of paper again. We have a motion and a second that Senate Bill 47, working on LC 490523 by substitute, do pass. Is there any discussion? Yes. Representative Evans. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to uh, just acknowledge that I uh, am going to be voting no, primarily because in our public school. Representative, and, uh, this discussion, we, we've had time on debate if this is discussion about the, the language of the bill or any, anything that you're seeing that needs to be adjusted or changed. Now's the time to address that. It's not just a comment. Okay, thank you. I'll thank you. Them. Representative Maynard. Representative Wade, I believe, was going to answer a question for Senator Gooch about if a um, child went to another school district, can that other school district not accept them or not? Senator, any comment there? I'm, I'm willing to learn from my good friend from Dawsonville. Uh, 13, 13. Can you hear me now? All right. Um, as a former school board member, I can tell you that uh, there were several occasions where we, as a public school, due to a special needs student, um, actually I know of one case where it was a 504 that became an IEP, where due to transportation needs and the family's specific situation, we partnered with a, a contiguous school system where we accepted that student um, willingly um, due to that specific need. And I, we already had two other students that had very similar um, uh, needs related to uh, their, in that situation was physicality or the, the limitations thereof. And so we accepted those students. So I, I definitely know that if there are situations in the state that if a public school is, is asked to teach a child and uh, the other school system is, doesn't have the ability to meet that need, that they find a way working with the, sometimes parent advocates as well as the medical community and even the special ed teachers and special ed directors within those communities. So I can speak to that in my general region. I can't speak to every single of the 180 school boards in the state, but generally speaking, they want to try to help a child and if they can meet those needs, they will. Thank you, Chairman Wade. Seeing no further discussion, we're gonna vote this by a show of hands. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, same side. Thank you, members of the committee. Motion carries on an 11 to five vote. So thank you, Senator Gooch for being here. Um, I'll get with you on that rule sheet. Members of the committee. Oh, uh, Chairman Cantrell gonna, or Chairman Wade carrying that in the, uh, in the house. I think Representative Wade's going to do it with Cantrell backing him up as his wingman. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am, we did. I think there's four or five members online total. Okay. Thank you. Members of the committee, uh, Senate Bill 59 is on our agenda. That will be postponed until the, as the speaker says, until the next legislative day. But at this time, if you will, Stand by for one moment. We're going to hand out uh, an addition to the agenda and we'll be back to discuss that after we hand it out.
Members of the committee, this will be our last piece of business for the day. Chairman Jaspers is going to present from his seat, which is number um, Chairman Jaspers, if you will introduce Senate Bill 42 and the LC version that we're working off of, and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members, for staying for a few minutes. Um, I know at this time of the year when something like this happens, the uh, hair on the back of your neck might stand up, and also those out in the audience, but I grant you that won't, you'll be uh, okay with this. We're working from the one that was just passed out, LC 490531S. And what I've done here, I'm trying to give us some options. Uh, you know, during the last weeks of uh, the session, things get lost, things don't get done. And I, what I've done is to try to, is like I said, give us an option. What you'll see in the bill from the very beginning is Chairman Carson's bill, the Dexter Mosley Act. You know, Chairman Carson's will be here to answer any questions about and the differences in the bill from Senator Thompson that you heard just a moment ago. I think it's been a very strong movement by this committee to pass this bill and get it across the finish line and figure this is probably the best way to get it done. Uh, it really just is an honor of the two ladies, uh, Ms. Sternovich and Ms. Uh, Mosley. I think all of us have met them in the hallway and just been honored by their presence and the uh, commitment they've done. Now, if you look at Senate Bill 42, there is a change. This is a Senator's Mullis bill on, um, on uh, school climate. And um, I've got a little thing I want to talk to you about. You know, I took out, if you look on line 141 in Senator Mullis' original bill, there was a cross out. Um, uh, you look at it, it says they took out, you'll see it is still in there, data on environmental and behavioral indicators, data on student behavior and school-based reactions. Um, as I told Chairman Dubnik, um, this bill came up last year and I held it. And uh, I challenged the writers of that current of that bill at that moment, uh, was uh, Representative Moore, to come with a solution, not just cross something out. Um, the ratings on school climate is a big issue. Uh, for parents, it is a transparency issue that must be maintained. And just crossing that out really just kind of did away with it. And I've challenged uh, the bill sponsors again this year. Um, I will be glad to work with them. I know this committee will be glad to work with them on taking on, and making sure that behavior is support, reported appropriately in the school climate indicators on, on their websites. I think it's important. Uh, you know, I live in a county that has one high school, two junior highs, and three elementaries. Some of the members in here have 40 elementary schools. With Georgia and people moving in all the time, the school climate rating is something that parents use and, are, and really want to see. So I thought taking that line out really kind of undid that without a solution. I don't think as long as I've been working with education, that's normally how we've done it. We've came with solutions. and. And that's what this bill does. Um, I've talked to Chairman Mullis, he's okay with it. Um, as, um, as, as substituting into his bill, he's fine with both of them. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions on by the second half. I do have Chairman Carson here who can answer any questions on um, Dexter Mosley. Well, and members of the committee, I, I just wanna reiterate that the language that we passed out from Chairman Carson in House Bill 545 is in this bill. Um, and I commend Chairman Jaspers for his work with, with Chairman Mullis uh, on this bill and, and really working to take things that the Senate passes across to us and makes them even better. So um, at this time, 
if there are any questions from the committee. Is there anything online? Representative Evans. So just to confirm, is this, excuse me, thank you, Chairman. So to confirm this bill is which, is which bill we heard earlier today? It's not, it's 545 that Chairman Carson presented earlier uh, this session and passed out of this committee. It's similar, very, very, very similar to what Senator Thompson presented earlier today. Right. Okay. Okay. So that's why we're keeping it. So maybe after Dexter Mosley. Yeah. Yes, okay. And then you yeah. added in the school climate. Well, this, the original bill, Senate Bill 42, was about school climate. Okay. And I added in the Dexter Mosley to it. I created a substitute to Senate Bill 42 by adding in the committee, as we'll hopefully do here in a minute, that to it. Okay. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm asking you to repeat yourself. Um, it's okay. But I was trying to follow, I was trying to read and listen um, and look at this new language all at the same time. And I'm a pretty smart fellow, but I can't do three things at once. Um, <laughs> That's not what I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just tell me again, I'm sorry, what is the purpose of Section 3? Okay, originally in um, Senator Mullis's bill, if you look on line 140, 141, at the very end of 140, the words data on environmental and behavioral indicators, data on student behavior and school-based reactions was lined out. And essentially what that did representative was take any reporting about school behavior and discipline out of the school climate rating. Now, some would like that. I mean, you know, there were people in this room who would like that. But I'm, I guess as we just saw in a previous vote or siding with the parents and children. And I think I'm okay with taking that out if there's a lot of um, additional lines in telling me how you're gonna fix it so that a parent in your neighborhood can know what's going on in the school in your neighborhood. And that's what I said. So that's why that's my challenge. Be glad to work with any of the folks to get there. I know this committee would know the chairman would to make sure that uh, behavior is, is appropriately and accurately reported. Does that make sense, Representative Wilson? Yes, thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. Anything online? Seeing no other questions, what's the will of the committee? We have, we have a motion that this bill do pass in a second. So the motion on Senate Bill 42, LC 490531 by substitute do pass. All those in favor, please say aye. All aye. opposed, same sign. The ayes have it and the motion carries. Thank you very much. Chairman Carson, you will be carrying this bill in the in the house, I understand. Does anybody else from the committee have anything for the good of the order? Thank you very much for your time this morning. We stand adjourned.